Hi to everyone and uh, welcome back to another episode today. And uh, today we have a very interesting topic. Today we will talk about football or footballers and education. And uh, a very important topic for myself personally as well, because someone who believes in education in any stage of life, even if you're football players. So it's for me a fantastic session today, the fifth episode. And we will talk about education. I'm, I'm happy to announce fantastic guests today from different places all over the world. So we have uh, from America, from, uh, from Utah with us. He will explain what he is doing there. Really thanks to being with us, Sam Brown. Yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning over there, I think. And Sam is a Harvard graduate. Yeah, and Sam plays football for Real Monarch. Am I saying it the right way? Yep, yep, Real Monarchs, yeah. yeah. Real Monarch, he is a midfielder, and he was four years at Harvard and was drafted then from Harvard as a, on the 17th overall in the 2019 MLS Super Draft uh, by Real Salt Lake City, correct? Sam? Yep, yep, Real Salt Lake. Sam, thanks a lot for being with us. I'll be back with you in a second. So our next guest is from, from France. I was nearly saying Switzerland. Uh, uh, he's very often in Switzerland. He is from France, from Cannes. And welcome, Stefan Erhardt. Stefan Erhardt is a founder of After Foot Association. And uh, Stefan had a playing and a coaching career. So very interestingly. And now he's an expert in the transition of footballers from playing to past career. So And the opportunities in past career. So it's a very interesting field. He has a 12 years experience in that. And especially he was a football player and the coach himself. And he will tell us more about that. Stefan, welcome today to our session. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And, uh, and one more guest from London, my neighbor from London. Huh? And actually, you don't live in London, right, Jono? You live a little bit outside in Lo Cambridge. Cambridge. Cambridge, yeah. But uh, yeah, from Cambridge, Jono, welcome. And Jono is the national head of player development and England under 18 manager for the independent schools football association. Is that correct? Am I saying the right way? Jono, thank you very much, Jono, being with us. And I really look forward to today's session. And as I said, for myself personally, is an area I love to talk about. And I'm really look forward to find out, and especially today, we, we can also introduce or talk to parents outside and, and young football players and tell them what they can do and, and your experiences. I think it's gold for them to listen what kind of experience you had in your careers. So we will try. And if there's any question, as usual, please put it on YouTube. Ask us questions. We will try to answer them in the end of the session. Yeah. And uh, yeah, before I start, I want to give a quick overview. So what we will do today. So for the and listeners and the people outside watching it today. So we will have three different stages today we will talk about. So we will have the youth stage, so the youth players, so very important stage. There must be usually a balance between school and football. So we will talk about how youth players can actually manage that and balance it. So they are in a kind of pressure of being at school and deliver it. And at the same time in football. So they're in the middle of something not easy. And we will talk about how they can actually manage both, yeah? Or is it both not possible? Yeah, so we will discuss what kind of ways there are they can do both, be educated and be a good football player. And at the, afterwards, the second stage, we will talk about professional football players. So that means they pass, they become a professional football player, and now they are in the career. What are they doing? Are they still educating themselves or just sitting home and playing PlayStation? Are there opportunities for them to educate themselves? What is there outside that these football players can do? Because we know they have so much free time. This is what you know in football. It's just football, having training once a day usually, sometimes twice. But that's it. Then they're at home and they have so much time. How can they use that time to benefit and profit after career from that? Yeah, it's very important. Whatever you put in now, you have the advantage afterwards after career. If it's doing an online course, if it's learning a language, I mean, there's so many ideas I think we will talk about today. And the last point today we will talk is after career. So we talk about youth players, we talk about the professional players, and we talk about the player who just retires. What happens with a the player then, right? What can he do? He's just above 30. 
32, 33, maybe 35, maybe some plays longer, goalkeepers, but that's it. That means they're suddenly in life and have to adapt to something very new. So what opportunities are for these people outside there? So that's the three areas we'll talk. But first of all, before we start with questions, I, want, I would like that you, all of you, introduce yourself more in detail. And Sam, you're from America, you're the far, furthest away. So I think we start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, again, th th thanks for having me. Um, I think this is a really cool experience and something that I haven't done before. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to share all my insights and stuff. I, uh, as I said to you earlier, I was born in Hong Kong and uh, I lived in Singapore for nine years. My family moved to Michigan, um, which is a state in the Midwest, when I was about 10. Um, I played for a club team there, um, a youth team called the Michigan Wolves. Um, my club team was affiliated with a professional team in the MLS, the Columbus Crew, um, throughout my high school years. So that was, that was more when I was 15, 16, 17. Um, I went through the whole the whole college recruiting process in in the states, which is unique. I think it's different from from a lot of the experiences that players in Europe have in pro academies, just because um, you know when I was going through the process, college was uh, a priority, but also a stepping stone for um, for players who wanted to play pro. It was kind of the intermediate step between between uh, between high school um, and the professional ranks. So. Uh, grew up in Michigan, um, played there. I was recruited by Harvard, um, some other schools as well, but I, uh, I wanted to go to Harvard. I wanted to kind of get the best of both worlds um, in terms of an education and a soccer experience. I, I wouldn't say Harvard was as competitive on, on the soccer side as some of the other schools that I um, was recruited by or, or we played against, but um, we were competitive nonetheless. And I think that was a, that was a good experience that I, I probably wouldn't trade in terms of um, like playing anywhere else. Um, played forwards at Harvard, like you said. Um, we had a, a couple ups and down, up and down years. Uh, uh, was drafted, like you said, by Real Salt Lake. Um, I played for their USL team, which is the second division team um, in the States here. Real Monarchs um, have been here a little over a year now. We, we were fortunate enough to, to win the league last year. So that was great, awesome in my uh, in my rookie year. So uh, that was really cool. Um, yeah, that's that's about that's about it so far. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, let's move forward. Let's move forward with Stefan. Stefan, now a little, little bit about yourself. What are you doing, and about your project you built and created? Yeah. Thank you, Arkut. Pleasure to be here as well. Um, I'm going to try to be as short as Sam, <laughs> which is a bit difficult because I'm probably much older. Uh, but I had a football career, as you said, not in the top divisions. Um, so basically, uh, I continue my studies while playing football. And um, I played in French teams. And then I moved uh, away from France to, 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 to fulfill my passion. So I played football in China, in New Zealand, in, in countries like this. And then I had the first um, glitch in my career when I was like 24. I got a very serious knee injury, so I couldn't play for several months and then realized, okay, uh, it's, football is good, but maybe I need to, to do something on the side so I can have like a double career. So I worked in a chamber of commerce for, for three years and I started to help uh, people in starting companies. And that's where I got in contact for the first time with players who were actually playing with me or against me or that I knew from before were either starting companies or willing to invest money in different projects. So I was helping in that way with the, the French player union. Then I went back to China for three, three years, played football again there and started my own company. Uh, and then at the age of 29, came back to my hometown in Strasbourg and um, started again my second career, which for me was the third career already. So went back to school, started uh, to do an MBA course about football industries in, in England, so in Liverpool. Uh, and I also started to, taking my coaching license. And um, I therefore joined my club, Strasbourg. I, I played and coached for them for like uh, three, four years uh, with different roles at the academy, with a professional team. 
Uh, and then I went, I moved to Switzerland. I worked three years for a, an agency uh, working uh, on media rights, marketing rights, or more, let's say, on the business side of football. And, and then I joined, uh, I joined UEFA as an employee uh, six years ago. Uh, but that's not the topic of the day. Uh, the project I'm here to talk about today is an association called Afterfoot, which was created in 2015 and in which we support players during their career and after their career uh, in various capacities. Wow. <laughs> That's a long, long career as a football player and always education between and as a coach. I mean, uh, and you have a lot of experience, so now you can give it back to players who are in that situation like you were yourself. So, so it's really valuable for them. Thank you very much, Stefan. We'll start talking in a bit. And then last but not least, Jono. Thank you very much uh, for having me and hello everyone. Um, so yeah, my I guess my my, my brief history, brief bio. Um, I was a, a young player at the academy when um, during my school years, um, and I'm looking back, very thankful to to my parents who um, rightfully um, moved me over towards the education side. So education became my priority, um, which actually was a, a blessing in disguise. I, if I'm honest, I was never good enough. Uh, I know that now, now, but certainly didn't at the time. Um, and it, it meant I, I, I moved to an independent school for those outside of the UK. That's that's Sydney school where where essentially parents um, pay or, or whoever it may be pay fees for the, the children to be there. Um, I then did my A levels. Um, I studied uh, aeronautical engineering at Loughborough University while playing football there. Suffered a, quite a serious injury there as playing football at Loughborough. Um, and that injury then meant that I looked to, to, to my coaching badges. So I went, went through my various coaching badges, um, then did my teacher training to become a PE teacher, um, as well as a master's in education. Uh, and now find myself as a teacher at an independent school, uh, the City of London School, as, as well as the National Head of Player Development at the Independent Schools FA, um, which basically is the, the governing body for all the independent schools up and down the country. Uh, that brings me to where I am here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you. Uh, it's uh, interesting what kind of careers you have and you're still in it. And uh, so we have different aspects, different angles to talk today. And that's the interesting thing, I think. And yeah, let's jump into it directly and talk about what's the importance of education for a youth player yeah, and young professionals. Like for a youth player, if he if a youth player is 15, 16 year old, right? We are in a situation, it's not easy. And especially if from the education side, the expectations are high from the family, right? And then and the boy is struggling. And at the same time, he is uh, trying or is playing in an academy. So how much is important there to still keep on education? Like maybe Jono, we end up with you. Maybe we start with you and then go around. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the, the hardest part is that the, these youngsters, um, you know, youngsters aren't very good at looking into the future. They're not good at, at seeing what, what could happen and what they want to be. Um, but at that stage, they, they do know what they want to be. They want to be a professional footballer. Um, but as we all know, the stats are heavily stacked against them. Um, and therefore, the education, from, from my perspective, is so important because it, it might, at that age, it might not happen for them. Uh, and giving up on on everything else just to, to focus on on that one route to be, being a professional footballer um, carries a huge amount of risk. Um, so from us from us as coaches, as parents, etc., advising those advising those boys, girls to be to be you know continuing with their education is really really important. Um, you know injuries can happen, careers are, are, are frighteningly short as we all know, um, and you know looking at what Stefan specialises in. Um, talking about our post careers. I mean, post careers now regularly is, is 30, 30 year old plus. Um, and as, as I know, I, I still feel quite young in my career, but I'm much closer to 40 now. So um, education, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Jono, while I'm with you, how is it right in the United Kingdom, like the educational sector? Like, how does club see, like, I mean, when it comes to education, like, is it like easy? And I will give some examples about other countries as well. Yeah, the, I mean, the UK, I think it's, it's fair to say it's improving. I think since the EPPP was introduced, um, where certain categories had to provide certain um, resources towards the education of their, their academy players, it's definitely improving. 
Um, but I think I think the culture in the UK is is, is a big problem because there isn't a culture right now of, of doing both. There isn't a culture of you can be studying and um, playing as a youngster. You, you know, the, the, the boys are still encouraged to be playing football and, and perhaps keep their education ticking along. Um, I think battling that culture is a real, real challenge in the UK right now. Okay, that means with other words, the families or the players have to do by themselves more really pressuring towards it and trying to make the best out of it, got it. So if we move on uh, in France, right? Um, Stefan, how is it there like? And what do you think about youth players and education? I mean, you work with players. They are actually right now professional athletes, but also after career. But how, how is it in France? And what do you think about youth players, about their education? Can they do both at the same time? Yeah, I mean, in France, I have to say that the, the professional academies are really well structured and um, I know many clubs who do really a great job at keeping the, the young players in the track. In France, we have uh, what is called baccalaureat, which is the diploma you do when you're like uh, 17, 18 years old. And this is your entry, entry pass for the university. So if at any time in your life you want to go to university, you will need to have this diploma. So we push as much as we can the players to make sure they go up to that level because if in the future during their career or after their career they want to go back to school they will need that, di that diploma to start again and um, we have many good examples like for example Rafael Varane or I can, I can tell so many others who even got this diploma with very high grades and very high marks so we have clear examples of players who can who could do both and every year in, in many French academies, you have a lot of players who graduate from this. And what I would like to say as well is that you were saying that these players were 15, 16, 17. This is still the age where they construct their personality and they construct their brain and they construct their way of thinking. So it's not an age where you can abandon school because everything you learn on a daily basis, even if you're not the best of your class, even if you're not focused nine hours per day will help you in this process of becoming an adult and becoming responsible and, 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 and growing during your career and being able to continue to learn in the future. Um, Stefan, is it in, in uh, France, is it like you said their academies, they help? Is, is education inside these academies or are they on private or, or, or the kids go to school, but the academies are working with these schools kind of in cooperation or help each other? Or is an academy where you have also teachers and school in it included? Is it one entity or is it two different? In professional clubs, what we call centre de formation, so professional academies, everything is included. You, the teachers come to the club. You are in a very uh, small side uh, class with maybe only seven, eight other players who are actually also your, your, your teammates. And uh, you have specific uh, courses and classes every day. So, it's really designed to support the players and they, are, they have all the tools they need. They even have breaks to, um, to have uh, some rest uh, after lunch. And then they have the, the, the training integrated in the daily routine, in the daily program. Okay, very interesting. Sam, uh, let's come towards you. But kid, you were at the university, you know, you went through the stage by yourself. How, how difficult was it for you to come first to university, right? To university like Harvard, you're right? And then to study at the same time and to play football, how is it over there? Like, and do you think, is that a system or is it a good model for European clubs or European countries? Would you would say that was something really good for me and it was good and I can recommend that as well for players from Europe, from France, from Germany, from England, coming over and doing the same because that's something we got always asked. So it's an interesting question. I think, um... I think Harvard's a, a very specific example because you have kids who are going there and their first option probably isn't to play professional soccer or professional football, right? But, you know, I think, I think the, 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 the youth soccer landscape in, in the States is, is shifting a little bit. You're starting to see more, um, more of the MLS clubs have academies. Like every, every MLS club now, you're required to have an academy. But like that wasn't that wasn't the case, you know, five, like ten years ago. Um, with those players, all their with those youth players in those academies, right now I think 
they're being pushed to put all their eggs in one basket. And that basket is, is trying to play professionally. So their first option, if they're, if they're in the, those academies is, is to play, is to play pro. Right. So the second option then would, would probably be to play college. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough because the kids, I think John alluded to it, but they don't have a good, there, there's, there's not much perspective as far as seeing into the future. Um, they're being told by these clubs, you know, want to play pro, but you're in a pro environment. Um, that should be your goal, your number one goal, you know, no questions asked. But um, I think people are just specifically in the pro academies, they're, they're just starting to promote the aspect of, of college. Um, whereas if you're not in a pro academy, if you're playing for an independent club team, um, I think college is, is, is a more viable option. I was in that boat where my parents always pushed education first. Um, and I used my, my, my soccer ability to, to help me get into Harvard, um, to help me further my education that way. Um, I think when I was at Harvard, the balance between, between school and the season and training and stuff, um, it was initially hard at first. Um, but I adapted to it, you know, as my third, my second, third, fourth year, I was, I was used to it. Um, I would say as well that um, it depends on which part of the year um, our, our, the college soccer season was in the fall. Um, so we had all our games then maybe at the time we had like a, a lighter class load then, whereas in the spring you could take more classes because the games weren't until uh, the latter part of the year, in a sense. Okay, and uh, just to just to get an understanding, you're like you're studying at Harvard, and do you have an everyday training? Like, do you have a program? Do you have a coach there? Is like actually an academy inside the university? Kind of is like, how does your day look like? Your day doesn't look like a normal student there. So, is it everyday training or twice training, or what do you do when other uh, students uh, they have, for example, a lesson? And uh, will you miss some lessons and have to do it afterwards? Or how does that work? And where do you train? Are you training at the campus or do you go somewhere else for training? So, so Harvard's athletic facilities, we just, we just, we, we train on campus. So the, the training field, we had a game field that was all, all on campus. Um, as far as classes, I think in season. So the fall was, was the game season. It's, it's not like the UK where they where the season goes from August until until May or, or June. Our games were from, from August until November. Mm. And then the off season was essentially from, from January until, until August. Um, so it was, it was, it's different from, from a lot of the, uh, the pro academies in the UK. Um, in the fall, because most of our trainings were in the afternoon, we would schedule our classes uh, in the mornings. So typically you would, you know, wake up, breakfast, go to class from maybe nine until 2 p.m., have training from three until, until five or six or so, depending on what you had to do, you know, if you had to get treatment or if you wanted to go to the gym or um, anything outside of uh, off the pitch, um, you do that, you'd have dinner after training and then you would, you'd get to work. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of a, a typical um, day in the life in the fall. You'd have, you'd have games on the weekends. Um, in the spring, it's different. In the spring, the, the games are essentially scrimmages. They're, they don't count for, for rankings or for points. Um, at Harvard, we had most of our trainings in the morning um, because the other sports at, at the school would have priority um, in terms of in terms of time slots for the, for the facilities. So they would get to use the facilities in the afternoon, whereas um, we had these in the morning. So, so most of our classes would then be in the afternoon um, and you'd have a, a bit more free time because um, you know, you, you have the afternoon, you have the afternoon free essentially. Sam, is there a kind of a, um, like you said, the pro academies and the universities, like is it in every sports now like that? Or is it just something for soccer? It developed in America that these pro academies like where you can go instead of a university, right? So you can go from there, become a professional player. But as I'm aware, like in basketball and all the other American sports, you have to go through college or, or do they have this academy system as well? 
So I don't think that other sports have academies. Um, I think they're looking into it, but I don't think like basketball, football, for example, um, those sports all have rules right now where you have to play in college for, I think for American football, it's, it's three years for basketball. It's one year. I think basketball just changed it to where um, before you want to enter the NBA draft, you can play overseas in a league for one year. Um, but, but academies and then the university is a bit different. You would, you would be in an academy until you were 18. And then once you were 18, um, I think that's when kids decide whether they want to uh, go to school and, and go, to the, go, to, go to the university and play for a university team, um, which is what I did. Or, or they, they're hoping to sign, to sign a contract and go pro. Okay. Okay, thank you. I mean, for, for my own experience, I played soccer as well. Like, maybe you're surprised now. No, maybe Stefan is surprised. <laughs> I played soccer or football as well in the youth. And I played quite, I mean, when I was 16, 17, I was actually earning more money than my dad in football, right? It was the time when I was really promoted. And there was a coach who was really like me and he promoted me and it was in a really good situation and and that what you said Stefan in France they have this thing diploma to go to university we have the kind of a similar thing in Germany it calls abitur and uh, you have to go 13 years to school and in the end of the 13th class you go to like an exam in different subjects if you pass it you can go to university and uh, and I was in the 13th class and I was at the under 19 and but I was already training with the first team and it was like my best time and peak and I was like uh, I was really like uh, playing football that was like kind of my life and but my parents pushed always towards education just an example my father never watched even one of my game in my life he, he never came like he'd say my son will study and that's it like you out of discussion right and but for me football was like hey that's my life I love football and I will never give it up so I was always trying to balancing both my whole life and then it came to a situation where I realized I will not make finish Abitur, the 13th grade. I said, because everyday training, except Thursdays, I had literally everyday training, Saturday mornings, even training, Sundays games. So I was not able even to do the homework, not even to prepare for the exam. So which is like you have the months before prepare. Uh, prepare. And I realized, okay, you won't make it. So what did I do is I went to the training ground one day and that guy who supported me was the uh, first team coach. And he played himself in Bayern Munich at that time and came back to Hanover. So he's a leg. And then I said to him, okay, so um, before training, five minutes, I said, can I, have a, can I quickly talk with you? I said, yeah, of course. So I said, you know, I'm in the 13th grade and I need to finish this year Abitur. And uh, I'm, I don't think I will be able to finish it. And I will have problems with my parents and my family. And I actually want to finish it as well. But can I come just maybe twice or three times for training this year? <laughs> you know what he said to me? He said, the reserve team is just uh, training over there. So from now on, you can go and train with the reserve team if you're not coming to training. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I was like 17, 18. I was like, I was like emotional, you know, and that time you're young, you know, you don't let someone tell you you can't make it. And then I said, I'm not coming at all. Who are you telling me what I will do and what not? I'm not coming. That day I finished some football. I went home. I was like, I just finished. I was so emotional. And because the way he talked to me, you're a reserve player. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not playing reserve. I'm first team player. I'm not going reserve. That was like, that touched me so much. And the way, so I went home. I said to my parents, I stopped playing football. I'm just will study now. Maybe I start afterwards again, after I finish Abitur. So, and then I finished Abitur. And then of course, when once you're in education, so you get some kilos when you're out of football, it's over, right? So after one year, <laughs> after one year, I totally realized, so it's done, right? So I, I started uh, studying uh, law and then that was the what happened and where I am today. But yeah, I loved it. But the system at the time wasn't easy. But today in Germany, like in France, uh, we have 39 elite schools in Germany, whole Germany, there's 39 schools. So the school is not integrated into the academies. Like you said, in some in France, there are elite schools nearly in every city in big city or some even in smaller ones in Germany. They got like a certificate from the German Football Federation for doing certain educational things with the academy. So the academy and these schools are working together so that the kids can train and have the school and education. I give you an example. I had one young player in Germany. He was playing at Schalke at that time. 
And uh, so he was playing for the youth German national team, right? It was like under 16, under 17. And uh, so he got a letter from the German national team, which was saying, if you not uh, get better grade at school, you will not be invited again for the national team next for the next invitation. He showed me that I couldn't believe it. It was true. They said he needs to sit down. He needs to learn. Otherwise, they won't invite him if he's coming with really bad grades. They didn't want to have un uneducated kids. So that was the change in Germany. And that's why, you know, in the end of 90s, a lot of things changed early 20, like after 2000, sorry, after 2000, it changed a lot. They started these elite schools. And now they are saying England is overtaking them. I don't know what John you said something else, but is there kind of a competition? They say England is coming with education and they're trying in Germany to, ch to change it to more education. And I give you a small example about Turkey. I, I lived three years in Istanbul, so I was able to go to the academies. They're not getting education at all. So <laughs> then you have the extreme. So when you're in an academy at Galatasaray, Fenerbahce or Besiktas, you don't need to go to school. So because you're one of, you know, you're 16 year old, you play in one of these big teams, you're like a star already. So the schools, the schools saying, come to our school, even private schools in, in, in Istanbul and other places in Turkey, they say, come to our school and play for the school team because the schools were competing with each other in big tournaments in the whole country. And it's like a prestige thing. And they said, wow, if we have someone from Galatasaray, Fenerbahce, Besiktas from the academy in our school, that was for the school, a prestige. And they said, you don't need to come school. You know, you can come and go whenever you want. We will always give you, you know, your pass. They, they, they pass every year without even attending, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, how does that work? Like for me, it was like coming from Germany, living there. I couldn't believe it. And today where we have a player, players in one of the three big teams in the under 17. So I had a phone call to find out if anything changed. 20, it passed over 10 years and nothing changed. Still the same, no education. The football federation doesn't care at all. There's only one club in Turkey who tries to do different is Altin Ordu. It's in closer Izmir. It's a private owned club by an owner who thinks education and football has to go together. And that's the club which brought these top players like Chalar Suinji from Leicester, Cengiz Zunder as Roma. So these players are coming from there, from this academy. So interestingly, he's the best academy now in Turkey. So he's trying to teach them English and other things. So by himself and, and the other clubs, man, it was unbelievable. So just to give you an idea, we say sometimes England is not good or Germany, France. If you go some other places, there is no education at all. So we could be happy that we have that what we have. And of course, it can be still better. Just some examples. Say the, it just a bit from the, the, what I work with with independent schools is, is parents are paying lots of, lots of money to go to our schools. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say we're the elite, but you know, some of our schools that you may have heard of, the likes of Eton and Harrow and Westminster, um, you know, the academic elite um, schools and independent schools over here, and parents are paying a huge amount of money for their, for their children to study at these schools. Uh, and the interesting battle that we have is when, when, the, when these players are coming to play in, the, in these schools, because at the moment these schools have been receiving lots of money, obviously, from, from parents. They've got plenty of money now to spend on facilities, on, on top quality coaches. Uh, I mean, the quality of pitches that our, our players are playing on are top draw. All the ex-pros now are coming to start to coach. Uh, and it's meaning more and more independent school players are reaching the standard. But then, they're, then they come to battle at 15, 16, when the, the parents are paying all this money for their kids to be academic and get the top grades, etc. And those clubs are saying, no, we want to, we want to take your, your, your son or, or daughter out, out, out of that school and bring them into, into our umbrella and, um, you know, we, we'll deal with their education. And, and what, we, what we're seeing is actually more and more of these type of, of players, parents are actually choosing to continue with independent education and saying no to the clubs. Um, you know, I've got, I've, I've got a nice example of uh, Daniel Bruce, sort of, you know, Dan Bruce of Mexico United, Sam. Um, Dan Bruce was, was a boy that, uh, you know, exactly that, was offered a pro at a championship club. Um, and, you know, they, what, the, the, that championship club wanted to take him out of his, out of his studies and, and move him out of his school. And he said, no, I'm, uh, I'm going to carry on with my studies. I'm going to get my levels done. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to go to America. And I'm going to get a degree. I've got, got my degree, and, and there he is over there, you know, playing in the USL, 
um, for New Mexico United. So you know, it, it is possible, but it's a really, it's a, it's a really big challenge at the moment that we, we've got because, you know, in independent school education, we, we're firm believers of the academic side of things, but we want the clubs, you know, the more and more of these clubs, you know, allow, allow players to, to, to do both the better from our perspective. Does anyone, thank you, Jonah, does anyone want to add something to the youth system or any other things? So otherwise we will move on to professional football players and education. Yeah, I just want to finish, uh, Erkut, by saying that we should not forget that players are going to be citizens. And, you know, as a professional player or even as, if you don't become a professional player, you will need to have the right tools to understand the world you're living in, to make the right decisions. Uh, to talk to your agents, talk to your clubs, talk to all kinds of people in your life. And only education can give you that. And um, I, I also believe that the clubs and the federations that properly structure education for their players, they take the benefit from it. If you, if you look at a player like uh, Kylian Mbappé, he, he, he got his degree uh, while playing Champions League with Monaco. And he did it. And he didn't, add, and he didn't get any favors. And now he's playing top top football and is taking extra lessons every day uh, to learn English and all kinds of things. So if those players at that level can do it, uh, the other ones can do it too. I agree. agree. I agree. I always say there's always, if there's a will, you know, there's a way to find, you know, and there's no excuses in life. It, it should be, if it's difficult and if you overcome it, it feels even much better. I mean, we have to make them believe that they can do it, you know, that's the problem usually mentally. We have to talk to the youth players and motivate them to tell them it's possible because they have never been there, right? It's a first time experience. And if we motivate them that it's possible, it's not easy, but it's manageable. And if you help them, I think it's possible to keep on to go both at the same time. Anyone else adding to youth or otherwise I'm jumping into professional football players? Yeah. So yeah. Go, go, go with pros now. They are all educated. <laughs> they all went off. So let's go with pro. And uh, in what ways should professionals be educated in things such as finances, right? How can you start preparing players for after careers? Well, but let's stick on with what should they do? Like football players, they start playing football, professional, and then they're out of the system kind of. There's no education anymore. And uh, I don't think other than languages, the clubs don't care about other than languages. I've seen over the years, they say, okay, if you come to England, you should learn English. We help you with an English teacher or that's it. Or if you, if, if you need a house, we put you in touch with someone or a car or a telephone, whatever, right? There's uh, someone in the club who helps with these things. But other than that, they're 19, 20 years old, earning some of them a lot of money already and they don't know what to do. And they're like, they, they don't need life. And especially, I think one thing is missing is finance. If you start earning suddenly 50,000 a week or 20,000 or 5,000 a week, whatever, and you never learned how to manage your money. So, and if parents is not, is not helping out or trying to help. So what are you doing? Like as a player there, and then this entourage, right? This is a football player and around the football player, they are so-called friends who coming like parasites, not always, but a lot. And then they're literally trying to get something from this player. And the player is, of course, he's trying to be nice, helping everyone, never want to say no. It's a very difficult situation. What do you guys think? And Stefan, let's start with you. I mean, you work with them for years. What do you think what's important? No, I think you said it all. I mean, to, to be honest, I'm, I'm passing the ball back to you because I think the, the agents have a big responsibility in that. Um, the clubs as well, but I think it, it should be a combination between what the, the, the club is providing to their players and also the agent. Um, sometimes the parents don't have the qualifications, don't have the expertise to teach their kids how to manage big amounts of money. So I think, first of all, that's the agent's role. And then uh, we will see in the future some new tools appearing um, to, to support players in that way. But I think, as you say, it's, it's crucial for the players and, and for his career to be able to, to make his own decision. And the, the, the challenge we have at the moment and something I, I experience with my players is that it's, it's almost impossible to find programs that are adapted to the professional players. So first of all, in, ter in terms of content, 
because the content needs to be adapted to the player. Uh, you cannot give academic content to players who did not go uh, enough to school because it will be too difficult, it will be too, uh, too, too, too long for them. So you need to adapt that. And then you also need to adapt the rhythm because as a professional player, you cannot just go to a school every day for five hours anymore. So that's the challenge that we see um, on our side with our organization. We, we are offering a specific uh, education program. We actually call it edu coaching because it's education and in the same time it's coaching for the, his own career. But um, it's true that we, we, we don't have any competition because no, no one else is providing this, this type of support at the moment. And uh, are, you, are you working right now with football players that are actively playing and football players, their career is over? You do both, right? And uh... Yeah, absolutely. Of course, I mean, for, for players, um, we're not talking about second career now, but the, the most important thing is to try to get prepared and to learn as, much, as, much, as many things as you know, as you can while you're still playing. Because as you said, that's when you still have some free time. And that's also sometimes where, when, when your brain is ready to take it on. And um, you just need to optimize the time. Of course, many players will say, yeah, but I want to focus on my football, etc., etc." But OK, you can take 30 minutes every three days to think about that. <laughs> and there's no excuse against that. And um, you're making good money, you're investing it in real estate or in, 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 in all kinds of things. You need to take time to understand what you're doing because you're playing with your own money. So it's, it's beneficial for you. It's beneficial for your family. If you want to do something with a friend or your, or your brother or whatever, okay, fine, do it, but then do it well. So make, make sure you have the capability and the expertise and the knowledge to do those things properly. So definitely 100%. This needs to happen during the career. You cannot wait for the end of your career to start thinking about this. No, no, no way. So with, so with other words, you're saying when the football player's career starts, he should actually start at the same time his educational career and not give it up to educate himself. And he shouldn't wait till the last four or five years of his career, correct? He shouldn't wait and say, oh, I have still five years to go approximately. I start two years before my career ends with some online education management, business, and then I go into it. That's the mentality a lot of football players think, right? Yes, but it's true that they're so far up to now, and I think the COVID-19 will probably help to change this. Uh, there were not so many content available uh, or uh, online education or tutorials or videos that you could actually find online even for free sometimes, and that can already help you to understand and learn new things. But this hopefully now in the next few years will, will change a lot and will help the players to, to get more and more information while they're still active. Okay. Sam, let's... I also think um, pre-career, like interesting from my perspective, that, that no, no, in the UK, nobody's being taught about mortgages and finances at pre-career. And actually I've got an experience at the moment with a, with a boy that's managed to, to stay at our school under our umbrella doing his A-levels with us, but also signed a professional contract at the start of this year, which saw a huge amount of money suddenly in his pocket as a, as a youngster. Um, and he got, he got straight nines at GCSE last year, which um, for those that don't understand GCSE system, a nine is given to the top two to 4% in the whole country. And he achieved nine in every single subject. He is one of the brightest kids in the country, full stop. Um, but also an absolute talent on the football field. And it was amazing him receiving this contract and obviously getting his first few wage pack packets and sitting down with him and, and you know, agents, etc. and how little he knew and understood, um, you know, talking about saving money and in what you, how you could invest it and what, you know, starting to think about that. And it's amazing that someone that unbelievably bright has gone through his life and not even thought about what on earth a mortgage might be um, you know, owning a house, what on earth, you know, I think that's a real shame. I think the more, the, the more you know, perhaps our, our whole education program within the UK needs to include that, you know, not just to footballers, to, 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 to our kids, so that they can prepare a bit better for the real world, I, I think. It's true. Sam, um, on your side, Sam, you are now playing football. What's with your education? Have you stopped everything or are you doing something? Be honest with us. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've forgotten everything. No, <laughs> I um I think it's I think it's actually a really good point that 
that Jono makes in that I think most kids in the U.S. Um, and most kids that go through like a, a, a traditional liberal education system, they don't have an understanding of, you know, personal finances, budgeting, investing, some of these civic, like when Stefan said, you know, being a citizen, um, you know, even for me coming out of school, I, you know, I'm, I'm paying rent now. Um, I, you know, you have to file your taxes. Like you have to understand your budget, you know, how much, how much money are you spending on groceries, car gas, anything that the club doesn't provide. Um, you know, I think, I think that was a huge kind of, there was a learning curve there, even for me from, from a kid who, you know, who went to a really good school um, and had and received a really good education. Um, again, I think it also falls on, on, on the agent as well. And, and that a lot of kids um, in the US, if they want to sign pro, um, they don't, they don't really understand um, a lot of the, uh, the priorities that you have to, that you have to manage when you initially sign a contract. Um, you know, I think, I think, I think, um, or you, you, you alluded to like a lot of it already, but, um, you know, I would, I would agree. I think as far as, as far as education, I, um, and I'm still, I'm still trying to learn things every day. I think, I think right now is especially crucial just because, you know, I'm not, I'm not training with a team. I'm training by myself. You know, I, I have a lot of free time um, anyway. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm still learning stuff every day. I'm still trying. I, I bought, a, I bought myself a, a guitar, <laughs> um, a little bit different than, than your typical, uh, um, you know, I guess lesson, but I'm enjoying it. So. Nice. No, sounds good. I mean, um, I can, I mean, you all said also the agents plays a role. Stefan really pressured it even more towards me, <laughs> like that it's our fault as well. I mean, you're hundred percent right. I mean, because uh, if an agent really takes care of uh, of their player, then this is one of the most important parts, right? I mean, to talk with the players about these things and to help them to build a career and to have a long term relationship. It's not just make a deal, get the commission, get out. I mean, this is like 80, 90% the business we are into it, unfortunately. But if you're really trying to work with your clients in a long-term relationship and really want to help them and really get happy if they get successful on and off the pitch, that's our success then, right? If you measure it from that. So I give you one example how I did it with one of my clients. So when you sign the new contract and I realized, okay, he will earn a decent amount of money. And I was thinking, how can I tell him now to save money? I mean, obviously, their parents and family members as well on the other side. And into getting into finance as an agent is not always easy if you don't have a very long, long relationship. Because the father might say, why is the agent telling you what to do with the money? Right? It's your money. We family should do this. So you need to be very careful what you do. And therefore, I was in a situation to say, I really want to help this boy. And, uh, I, and I realized if I don't tell him to save, uh, some in the family will eat the money. Right? Um, <laughs> I've seen the picture, right? And I said, okay, this boy needs to do something for his own, right? Not just for the family. Of course, players help family members and, you know, that's their family, but it's also the boy's future, right? So what can he do? And so I went to the bank and had a meeting with the bank and I said, guys, look, my, this player, he just started earning this amount of money and we need to put every month a certain amount on the site. And hopefully in two, three years, whatever, we can buy him an apartment and a bit mortgage and everything. Let's do something like that because I think it's important that he starts now. And the bank said, no, we're not doing that. You know, that's not our job. And the bank wanted actually to invest the money in phones and stuff. So I went there for savings. They, and then they told me, you know what, if he's earning that, why he's not investing into uh, shares. And he said, man, I'm not here for that. Just saving. Yeah, just saving. We tell the boy, this goes to a different account. He can't touch the money. And after a certain time, at the same time, we start looking for like a, a, like a, like a house and apartment. And when we find the right time, so we can use this as the first 20, 30, 40 payment. And then the rest he pays in two, three years off, right? While he, during that contract he has, right? I planned it all within five years. Like how can we have in five years, save money, buy a house and pay it off? So that was my model but i'm not a financial expert right so i went to the bank and they said we can't do that so we will not advise the player to put i said around 70 to 75 percent if every month 
it's a different account. He can't touch it, right? And they said, we can't do that. That's not our job. And I said, my friend, you have 10 days time. If you don't do it, we change the bank. Simple, he's my client. So and not, you're not losing him. You might lose in future as well, other clients. So think about it, come back to me. You have 10 days. So literally on the 10th day, I got an email. And I said to them, you send an email to my client. You know him, right? He has an account there when he came here. And then put me on CC and tell that you want to meet him. And I said, the meeting will be on the training ground. So the player doesn't even need to go to the bank to talk to them. So I will arrange that as well. So, and then, uh, and then we will arrange it. This, so I got an email, I was on CC, they addressed the player, hi player X. So we would like to meet you. It's about your finances. Can we come to the training ground? Can you let us know which day would work? It's important. So the player calls me and said, have you seen the mail? Yeah, I've seen it. And I'm saying, what does these assholes want from you? Like, oh my God, like these bankers, but thanks God they're coming into the training ground. So you can meet them there, you know, five minutes, tell them off, you know, and then come home. Yeah. So he said, yeah, I do that. Yeah. You know, I don't know what they want from me. I say, yeah, but they said it's important. So meet them five minutes. And in the end, he met them. He came back home and then he called me, he said, Eka, you know what? Yeah. You know, I have a good idea. You know, we should put like 70, 75% every month in a different account. We save it and then we buy like an apartment or house. You know, it's important to have a mortgage. And they said a lot of players go bankrupt to see after five to eight years, whatever, and say, wow, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So this is this is a way, this is one example of thousand an agent has to work or can do, right? So either give them the idea, then going them and saying aggressively, get your money and put it there, right? It's the way how to do things. And this is what I learned over the years because every family is different. Every player is different. And for everyone, you have to have a different strategy. With some, you can sit directly together and talk this, that you should do it. But with others, you can't. So with some, we have to talk with the father, with some, with the mother, with some, with the brothers, with some, with the wife. So you have to learn to adjust yourself as an agent to every different case. Every family is different. Every boy is different. So there is no one way. That's what I'm trying to say. But just here for you, an example. Let's move on. I want to hear a little bit more about the US system. Like, why is the US such an attractive perspective for young athletes? When I hear, even for myself, I said, if I, if I would have the opportunity back then, I would pack my stuff, I go to America and study and play football at the same time, yeah? So why is America for us like, wow, we wanna go there, we wanna study there and we wanna play football at the same time. What is different? I mean, Jono and Sam, I mean, one of you starts first, maybe Sam, you, and then I give it to Jono. Sure. Um... I mean, it's, it's interesting just because I, since I've grown up in the U.S., I, I think I've noted more that um, people in, in Europe and around the world are um, attracted to, it might be the university system, it might be just the, the, the image of the United States and um, land of opportunity or, or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I think it's, it's a combination of of maybe all, all of the, the big time names in the universities. Um, I, I, to be honest, I, I'm not really sure. Um, I think, I think it, it might be easier for, for John to speak on just because, you know, as an American, I think I have a, maybe a, a limited perspective as, as, to far, as far as why people are so attracted to it, so. Okay, and, and Jono, on your side, there's students or you know, they go over the students like kids when they're 16, 17. You have it, I think, in your system. They yeah. went already over and some still going, right? And yeah, what, yeah. So we, what are they saying? The most popular, most, most popular route now. Um, I, I, I'd, I'd say those that get into my England under 18s who have who've done that, you know, doing their A-levels, um, who've given up perhaps professional football because they want to continue their education. Um, the US route is, is, the, is probably the most attractive thing. Um, I think the big big thing is the scholarships that, that, that these boys are, are being offered to go over there. Um, you know, the UK, a UK degree used to be so much cheaper than a US degree, but the disparity now is, is, is it's sort of the gap between the two prices is closing as ours is getting more expensive. It's not, not you know, a, a massive difference, but a, a US university, I mean, examples have got got three boys this year that have been offered full full rides at American universities. That's that's free education, that's free accommodation, free food, free textbooks, the works to go over to America to play in, in front of big crowds, uh, as you've experienced, Sam, 
um, in amazing facilities, being flying, flown around the country with, I mean, it's, it just sounds absolutely amazing. Or they could stay in the UK, and unfortunately, the UK universities, I think we are, unfortunately, behind the times with regards to that. I, you know, looking, looking around the various universities, the, the, the biggest scholarships I can see are sort of in, in the way of maybe £5,000 a, a year. Um, whereas, you know, you're literally talking hundreds of thousands of dollars um, worth of scholarship that have been given to go, go over there. And then you get the proof of the, in the pudding of the, of, the, of the people like yourself, Sam, who, who have gone, who studied, who got themselves a degree at the end of it. So you've got your fallback option <laughs> and you, you walk into, an, you know, into, a, into a big contract. I think the ISP has had a really good six, six months. We've had four, four boys sign sign contracts at MLS and USL clubs. Um, you know, an example, Lawrence Wyke, um, who literally just graduated from Furman University and um, before the lockdown made his debut for Atlanta United in front of 65,000 people. And he, he turned down the academy route over in the UK. Um, and you know, he's, he's boasting A-levels, a degree. I, I don't know the details of his scholarship, but I know he was a scholar at Furman. Um, and he's he's now a professional footballer, you know, living living the, the dream as well. So it's hard not to. Like, take me there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's also what I hear. That's is re everything what I hear about the system over there. For the ones who are going, are really happy that they've been there. That's the importance, you know, to get the feedback from them. That's why I tell to some of the players if they're really talented as well on, on and off the pitch to be educated. It's another opportunity at least to create this opportunity. That's what we have to do on our sides to give the boy one more option to say, look, you have this option, but you have also the option to go and it develops them. When you are 17, 18, go out of home and live in another country. It also develops your personality. I think it's not easy to leave a country, go somewhere else. Okay, it's English speaking. For people from England, it's easier to go to America than from Another country like French, French people don't speak much English, I think, or am I wrong, other than uh, Stefan? Not <laughs> like this. That's what in Germany always say they don't speak English much. And yeah, that is, it's difficult, but from England it's easy. You know, it's, I think it's a shame though that we, I, like, my, my, you know, I do think it's a real shame that the UK are losing a lot of really talented footballers who are clever to America. I, I, you know, I've got friends that, that run football programs at our universities who are desperately trying to make make changes there and to, to, to try and improve that um, because it, it does mean that the, the MLS and USL are, are benefiting from, from you know, lo lots of players coming over from Europe at the moment. So fingers crossed that does improve. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's maybe move on. We haven't talked about the players after career. I mean, we talk now about youth, professionals, and uh, let's talk a little bit. I'm taking a lot of time of use. I can see we're nearly one hour. But let's talk about a little bit after career. And I think, uh, Stefan, you are the expert for that. Like you work in that field uh, every day. That's kind of what you do. So what's important there for players after career? What can be done? Like, what is your work? How does it look like? What are you doing with these players? So, yeah, basically, as I said before, the most important thing is to start before it's finished. Uh, because you can easily understand that when, when you're still an active player, you have every day lots of people coming around you, asking for asking questions, trying to be nice to you, trying to do favors to you and who are attracted by the shiny life of being a footballer. And um, you realize when your career is over that this stops actually very, very quickly. It doesn't matter the level. And therefore, um, if you're smart, you want to use all that, all those contacts and all that network and build it while you're still active because that's when all the good opportunities come. Now, th there is a, another side of the coin is that, as you were saying before, uh, we consider this as the entourage of the player and not all the people who come to you asking you for different things or giving you different opportunities come with good intentions. So the player needs to be able to compare and to analyze the, the different uh, opportunities and, and offers that he receives. So we help the players in that sense. So we're never ever gonna take the player's money and put it here or there or start a company for him, et cetera, et cetera. We educate, we teach the player how to make those decisions. So for example, you were talking about mortgage, you want to make an investment in real estate. Okay, we're gonna help you with your 
understand how to do a mortgage, how much money to put up front, how to negotiate with your bank, uh, how to negotiate the, the, the rate of your mortgage, how to negotiate the insurance, uh, which questions you should ask to the real estate agent, how to compare different offers and so on. So we're really there to support the player in the process so that he gains this knowledge and expertise on the way during his career. And therefore, he can already at least analyze the different opportunities that he receives. And then on the way, he can make decisions either to invest or keep some contacts on the side or maybe invest in a clever way with some other people or um, keep all those contacts uh, hot for that when he decides to stop his career, he can, he can still use them. But the second point I wanted to make is that you need to do this process during your career because you never know when it stops. And that you were mentioning before, like 32, 33, 35, of course, but that's in the best case scenarios. And don't forget in Europe, the average length of a professional career is only five years. So if you take the average all across Europe, all professional contracts for all the careers, the average is five years. So you do have a lot of players who can luckily play until 30, 32, 35, but you also have an awful lot of players who finish their career at the age of 24, 25, 26. And this can come from uh, an injury, like proper sporting injury. Um, I had a big one, but it can happen to any player. Uh, it can also come from um, lack of performance. So basically, you're not as good anymore, and then suddenly you, you get a, a, a weaker contract, and then a weaker contract, and a weaker contract. You end up being in force of fifth division, and that's maybe not really what you wanted to do, or the money is not enough anymore. Uh, or you can also imagine like proper accidents, because as I said, players are citizens. Let's never forget that. You can have a car accident, you can have an, a, a, a problem with your health, you can have a heart, anything. And people often forget that because they, they, they are so, um, so ambitious and so proud and so strong in their day-to-day -day life. Everybody around them is telling them how nice they are, how strong they are, how fast they are. And suddenly they, they start, start thinking they're Superman. And they start thinking that they cannot have any problem. But that, that's not the truth. That's not the reality. So you never know when it strikes you. And therefore, you, you need to get ready during the entire process. I mean, um, that was really interesting, especially the point you made. The average career of a football player is just five years. I mean, we don't think about that. We, we, we always think it's 10 to 15, right? That's what we think. When he's becoming professional with 18, when he plays till 30, 32, 35, must be around 15 years, like, right? That's, the, that's what we think. But we never hear about them who just started a career and then just drops out. And that's, that's a lot, lot of players. And we don't talk. And especially in England, if you have such a high competition, you were just talking why some of the kids going to America if the Premier League brings half of the players from abroad, so there is no much place for the younger ones coming up. Simple, right? It's competition. So they end up playing League One, League Two. So if playing League Two your whole career or League One, will it be enough financially to secure yourself? When is financially, I mean, how many people or how many players are financially secure after finishing their career? What's the percentage? Like, is it 10%? 20%, they never need to do anything. Are they financially done? I don't, I think it's less than that. Yeah, it must be. I can give you a, a figure about that. And it's actually a very worrying figure, to be honest. It's, it says that um, after five years of retirement, 40% of players do not have money anymore. And we're talking here about all across Europe for all professional players. So if you take a changing room of 22 guys, eight of them will be broke five years after the end of their career. And that includes the guys who play in, in, in Bundesliga, in Premier League, in La Liga, whatever you want, you name it, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if the guy is making 100K per season or 10 million a season. 40% of these guys will be broke five years after the end of their career. The reasons for that are multiple. Uh, lack of education, maybe lack of knowledge, not good management of money, maybe bad advice, people trying to scam them, um, bad divorce, uh, injuries, 
etc. You, you, there are so many options to, to lose money. <laughs> It's endless. Yeah. You, you, you so, were laughing when you said bad divorce. Is this, <laughs> is this something happen a lot, really? Yes, right? Well, It's true that when you end your career, and I actually, again, with COVID-19, many players suddenly realize what it is to be with their wife uh, seven days a week. <laughs> Because when you're playing on a daily basis, you're traveling a lot and you're often out of the house, etc., etc. So basically, that's what the guys live when they end their career. Suddenly, they're not a champion anymore. They're a guy sitting in the couch and not doing much, watching TV. And um, suddenly the, the, you start discovering a new person. And that is not just about the money, but it's also like some factors that make that um, many players do divorce after the end of their career. And uh, if you add on top of that the stress of uh, not doing sports anymore, the stress of not being with your friends anymore, with your colleagues, with your teammates, not being in the dressing room, uh, the physical miss of not training every day at the same level, which is basically that you really feel inside you. And then most of the times also changing house because it's very likely when you finish your career that you're gonna, you have to move somewhere, either back to your hometown or to a city that fits for your family, etc. If you put all those criteria and all those stress factors together, imagine what is happening in the head of a player when he finishes his career. It's like basically it's chaos for six months to, 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 to 20 months. I think Sam, so, is, Sam is looking like and listening very careful. I don't think he would get married while he's here, football player. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> he was like, very <laughs> Sam, yes. if the right person is there, you'll get married. Don't worry. But it's, <laughs> it's like <laughs> many weddings are still going really well. Huh? It's not the, the, the rule yeah. for everyone, but it's, it's a stress factor on top. And if you, if you think about all these stress factors put together, how can a person Uh, be um, cold-headed at the moment, at this moment of his life, and think how to plan the next 30, 40, 50 years. Because we forget that, of course, doing 10, maybe in, in the lucky, lucky scenario, you play 10, 15 years of, of professional football. It's the peak of your career, and never again in your life you will have such a fantastic job, such a fantastic life. Okay, we know that. You still have to work for 40 years before you reach the proper retirement. So if imagine you have family, kids, you have to pay for education, you have to pay for your house, you have to pay for your car, you have to support your family, you have to support for your, your, your wife or your children, etc. Maybe a divorce, a second wife, third wife, uh, for some cases. Um, that costs a lot of money. And if you're not prepared uh, and you put that on top of all the stress factors and the fact that from one day to the other, you have zero money coming in, of course, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So again, The only solution is to start thinking about it a bit before, to get organized, to have good people around you that can give you advice and that are becoming mentors for you and that are, are guiding you in the right directions and, and stopping you from doing stupid mistakes. Uh, and I mean, in our organization, we have at least 30 ex players in the group and they behave a little bit like big brothers, you know, so that the younger players can talk to them And they can give them advice of what to do, what not to do, how to do things. And, and this is a good um, transmission of values and knowledge because uh, when you hear people like Robert Pires or um, Sebastian Kilachi or Eric Abidal uh, giving you advices on how you should manage your career and how early you need to plan because the end is tough. Um, hopefully this, this helps the younger players to realize that um, They cannot wait for the last moment. It's, it's suicide. Yeah, I mean, I just have to come quickly back to the thing that the players are the whole time at home right now and uh, with the wives and where they can't get out, right? You said now they're realizing and there was a discussion like ongoing in one of the countries they said in Europe, I don't know which one, the, the players to, uh, to continue the last few games, they need to go for nine weeks or so in a hotel and stay there the whole time till all the games finished And then they said the, the players would back to have 12 weeks after this, like, <laughs> just nine weeks. They say, would the players mind? I said, oh, believe me, they would all go and they, they will stay 12 <laughs> weeks. They just let them out. They want to all go out, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's very important. Another, another interesting uh, information that was released in, uh, in a study from FIFA Pro just a few weeks ago was that during this um, COVID-19 crisis, we see more and more players um, feeling um, some kind of depression. 
And these, these the factors that they are living now in COVID are exactly the factors that they will live when their career ends. And therefore, you can easily understand why players in their second career have struggled to find a second life because basically the most important thing to do is find a new life, find a new passion. If you manage to find a new passion, uh, it will be okay. You will do new things, you will meet new people, you will have new activities, maybe also new sources of income. And then your life as a footballer will remain as a nice souvenir and lots of good friends. But if you don't get prepared and if you just wait for the wall to be in front of your nose, um, it hurts much more. That's true. Sam, just bre coming to you, do you know already what you want to do after Korea? Have you already made any thought? Now, I mean, you're now in the career beginning of your, but is there anything you think if football, because of whatever, one day, Hopefully you play till 33, 35, but if you finish early, there is something you have already in mind or thinking about? I mean, I, well, I mean, I heard you have the guitar. I don't know if it's that. Guitar, yeah, guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think, um, I, I've started thinking about it for sure. I think, I think one of the benefits of going through the university system was that I was exposed to a lot of different careers and um, options before I even started playing professionally. Um, so I think that was a huge benefit. And I think being in that environment, um, you know, most of the regular students at Harvard, and I think most of the regular students at universities, um, they're your peers and they're going through interview processes. They're, they're talking to companies already about what they want to do. So um, for me, I, I was lucky enough to be in that environment because my peers were also going through it. So it was kind of, kind of, it was in my best interest to already start thinking about it. Um, in terms of what I want to do specifically, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think I, I would be interested in, in going to grad school, whether it be business school or law school, um, and then kind of and, and kind of deciding from there. But, um, you know, I, I can't say right now that I want to, you know, be a banker or going to or, or going to finance or or stay stay in soccer and, and, and do um, and um, work on the business side of soccer. So. Um, I'm not entirely sure yet. Do you know, Sorry, say that again. Do you know, do you have anything to say about after career you want to add? And do you no, not really. No, I, I tend not to get to see that sort of side of things. I admire, admire your work, Stefan. I, I, I don't envy what you what you you have to do and what you're setting up. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Stefan, especially on this part. I mean, it was really helpful to see and understand and as this is the mentality as soon as you start to prepare for after career as better for a player is you know they, 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 there is no too soon actually right there is to start right away and uh, as you said uh, you you created that program is it a kind of a app or how did the players come into it like or you also wrote a book I think right in but it's in French you said but will be translated to English yeah, the programs we do with the players, actually, this, this works a little bit like a private club because obviously um, the resource, the time we have uh, for each player is, is, is limited. So we work with this private club where we have players ref referring each other. And once we take a player in the, in the club, we really take care of him full time. And we, we, we have sessions every two weeks or every three weeks on specific topics. And we really adapted all this content uh, to the needs of the players, uh, but it's true that um, th there will be other tools uh, in the upcoming months coming for players uh, from, from different football institutions. Uh, and also, uh, as you said, we, we, we wrote a book with uh, some advices and the methodology on how you can prepare all this. So it's already available for people who, who are lucky enough to, to understand French. Uh, and, but also, Otherwise, for others, we hope in the next few months to be able to release uh, an English version. Okay, thank you. No, that's very interesting. Um, thank you for that. I mean, I'm I'm done with my questions. Uh, actually, I could talk another one, two hours with you guys, which I, I really enjoy. And, as, and especially, I learned myself a lot today as well, from the US system till journal to the private schools in England, and also the after career, what kind of options there. So it's not just educating people outside, educating ourselves and myself. So it's really good. Thank you for being today here with us, with me for this. I really um, appreciate that. I say thank you on behalf of me and behalf of my team, which works behind like Charlie, Jack and everyone else who helped to make this happen. And uh, yeah, and hopefully 
in another episode one day for something else we come back together again and uh, yeah i wish you all the best do you have anything to say do you want something at which you have in mind and we're thinking should i say it or not please feel free to do it now and then we will close it thank you for having us thank you very much really enjoyable thank you jonah yeah i, I don't have anything else to say to say really um i again like i, I enjoyed it um and i'd be happy to do something else in the future um you know if, if if you need anything else thank you very much appreciate that stefan you have the last word yeah thank you uh, Erke. it was really interesting uh, for everyone i think um thank you also for all the people who, who listen to us um and let's not forget that in those difficult times uh, football has to unite uh, the coaches the players administrators agents everyone should be together uh, in this difficult situation um, it will pass and football will come back and hopefully uh, what we have experienced over the last few weeks and months uh, will help us to have a more uh, clean football and a more clean uh, football industry in the future and um, will we'll help everyone to, to come back to football with a big, uh, big smile on our face. Hopefully. Sounds great. Great. Great finish. Perfect. I'm not, I don't need to say any much more after that. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Jono. Thank you, Sam. Pleasure having you and I wish you all the best. Yeah, stay Healthy, most of all, keep safe and think positive for the future. That's the most important thing for all of us, I think. We'll be back soon. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Take care. Ciao. Bye.